Hello, everyone. Let's wait a few minutes and let everyone else come into the room. Can anybody hear me okay? Can you hear me, Kyra? How are you doing this evening? Excellent. Excellent. All right, I'd like to welcome everyone to my Sunday YouTube live discussion. Um, this week, we're going to talk about mold disease transmit, how mosquitoes are able to transmit coronaviruses. Um, the reason I did this presentation, uh, you know, I talked about immunity, I talked about microorganisms, I talked about biosecurity and things like that, but I felt that I needed to talk about how, um, you know, pathogens are transmitted. You know, people are on the, the assumption, which is COVID-19, as well as other infections that, you know, just them washing their hands is good enough and they should not be able to, you know, transmit a pathogen, but that is not always the case. And so we're gonna go over some things that um, will actually allow for pathogen transmission. Um, so with that being said, I'm going to switch off the camera and I'm going to share the screen here. So we got a lot of information to cover today. So first thing we're gonna talk about is what is an infectious disease? We're gonna talk about modes of disease transmission. Then we're gonna talk about nosocomial infections. Then we're gonna talk about things you can do to minimize your exposure. And uh, those things are like isolation, quarantine. We're gonna explain what those are. We'll talk about PPE. Then we're gonna talk about some co-infections. And then we'll talk about can mosquitoes actually transmit coronavirus. We'll conclude. And I'll talk about Kiwi protos a little bit. And then if you guys have any questions, you know, you can always ask questions during the presentation. Um, but if you have any at the end, I'll also answer them there as well. All right, so what is an infectious disease? Well, before we talk about what an infectious disease is, we want to talk about epidemiology. And I've, I've talked about this before, but it's very relevant to this uh, presentation. So epidemiology is the branch of medical science that investigates all the factors that determine the presence or absence of diseases and disorders in a population. So these diseases can be chronic or they can be infectious diseases. We're going to focus on infectious diseases. So infectious or communicable diseases are those caused by a pathogenic microorganism, such as a bacteria, a virus, some type of parasite, or fungi. The disease can be spread directly or indirectly from one organism to another. So last, last time we met on the uh, Sunday discussions, I talked about different types of microorganisms, and I told you guys what the difference between the bacteria and the virus was, and you know how certain things that we were using that are you know, targeted for bacteria won't necessarily work on a viral infection like the COVID-19. Um, so, you know, microorganisms, they, there are beneficial ones, but there also are those that are pathogenic, which means they can cause disease. Um, and these are transmitted multiple ways. So, understanding how infectious the pathogen spread is critical to preventing infectious disease. There are many modes of transmission, but first you must start with the source of the infection. So we're gonna go through three terms um, that I've kind of seen thrown out in the news, you know, every now and then. Um, but uh, these, are, these are the things that we're gonna have to be looking at. You're gonna look at a reservoir. A reservoir is the natural host or habitat, living or non-living of a pathogen. Uh, an example of the coronavirus that we have circulating, the, co the SARS-CoV-2, um, they're saying that it has a natural host as a bat, but there are other animals that are host to coronaviruses. So the source, the organism, or an item from which the infection is directly acquired. So using COVID-19 as an example again, you can say, you know, uh, although bats are a natural host, the virus did not necessarily have to come directly from a bat. 
So it could have came from rat bat droppings. It could have came from bat, you know, some type of fluid that came out of the bat's mouth or its nose. It could have been on a surface and someone could have came by and picked it up. I know people always try to say that, you know, people were eating these bats and that's how the virus got into humans. That's not always the case. The, yes, the bats are a host to coronaviruses, but there are other animals as well. So the bat could have passed it on to another animal or it could have been on an item or it could have been in water. And I'll show you a picture of what I mean in a minute. Um, then there's carriers and there's asymptomatic carriers and then there's carriers that are actually infectious. Um, these are an organism. This can be a human as well as an animal. All right, can you guys hear me okay? Because I said my mic had muted. Can you see the picture, Kyra? Or is it just a whole bunch of lines? understand why it keeps going out. Okay. Um, I'll just go to this picture because it keeps trying to not go. No, I don't want to show that. One. Uh, having some technical difficulties here. I don't know why it's not showing the presentation. Okay. I don't know what's going on. <laughs> we'll just skip that picture. All right. So let's talk about modes of disease transmission. Um, 
there are two types of modes of disease transmission if direct and indirect and under it direct and indirect there are uh, categories that you can break them off into um, direct transmission yeah direct contact droplet droplet infection contact with soil inoculation into the skin or mucosa and transplacental or vertical transmission then under indirect transmission you have vehicle borne vector borne airborne fomite borne um, on clean hand and finger. Um, <clears throat> regardless of the reservoir carrier or the source, transmission must occur for an infection to actually spread. I don't know why these pictures are showing up. Yeah, the image the image will come in and then it'll it'll fade out and it'll be um like all these lines. See if I can do it this way. I don't want to do it this way, but I might have to. Yeah, it's gonna be too small. Yeah, they sent me a warning message when I got on here that we're having some technical difficulties with YouTube and things like that. So I must be experiencing some of those technical difficulties. Okay, so modes of disease transmission. So direct, uh, uh, an example of direct is a direct contact transmission. Here the agent is transmitted by physical contact between two individuals through actions such as touching, kissing, bites, or sexual intercourse. An example of these uh, direct, you know, pathogens that can be transmitted are, you know, ringworm, HIV, and lice. Um, those are actual parasites that can be transmitted when people have close hair contact and things like that, or body contact with their body lice. All right, another another form of direct contact uh, is droplet contact tr transmission. When an individual coughs or sneezes. Small droplets of mucus uh, may contain pathogens are ejected during that sneeze or that cough, um, even also when you're blowing a nose. This leads to direct droplet transmission, which refers to droplet transmission of a pathogen to a new host over distances of one meter or less. Uh, so this is not considered airborne because it's not over one meter, but if it was over, if it's under one meter, it's considered droplet transmission. So an example would be like flu, um, you know, you can sneeze and it can be in the air. And if you're in close range, somebody can actually, you know, breathe in those droplets um, and they can become infected with the flu. Uh, COVID-19, we'll talk about airborne uh, transmission, but it kind of follows both of those. They're finding that it kind of follows both. Uh, it can do the droplet transmission if it gets caught up in mucus. But they're also finding that it can actually live on, um, it can be aerosolized and live on dust particles and things that are in the air. So it can actually follow both. All right, contact with soil. When a person walks barefoot or skin has direct contact with soil or vegetation that may contain pathogens. So an example of this is when, um, People are walking around and soil may be contaminated with hookworms. Um, hookworms are a nematode that actually um, will burrow in through a person's foot. So that's why it's always uh, wise to walk around outdoors, especially if you're in an environment that you know that's not proper sanitation. Uh, hookworms are transmitted through uh, feces. Um, and then what happens is they uh, will live in a live in the soil and things and wait for a host to come by and then they'll go and burrow up through that person's foot. So 
contact with soil, uh, direct contact with soil can also transmit pathogens. Um, there are other pathogens that can be transmitted this way as well. About to stop this for every few slides and reload it. Okay, um, I'll just read it and maybe the next slide will load. Um, there's another form of direct uh, um, transmission and it's known as inoculation into skin or mucosa. This is when a pathogen enter, enters in a person through the skin. Um, this pathogen can also enter into a, an animal as well, but we're just gonna use an, uh, humans in this uh, example. Uh, so an example would be, be would be when a person is using a needle and they're injecting a drug um, an example of a virus that would be transmitted is hepatitis C via that drug. Um, so what happens is they're inoculating themselves with a item that is not clean um, and it has a virus on it and then they're directly inoculating this virus into their body. All right, another form of direct transmission is transplacental or vertical transmission. So basically what this is, is it occurs when a pathogen, um, pathogens are transmitted from a mother to child during pregnancy, birth, or breastfeeding. And a great example of this type of transmission is when a child, uh, when a child is born, if their mother had hepatitis B, they can actually get hepatitis B um, either in, in utero or they can get it as they're, um, you know, as they're passing through the birth canal. Um, so what they do to prevent this, as soon as the child is born, especially if the mother is hepatitis B positive, they'll give the child an immunoglobulin ejection to hopefully keep the child from acquiring that virus. Um, for the most part, uh, it has been successful, but there have been cases not take well and that the child ends up with hepatitis B. Um, like I say, it's usually it's usually successful, um, but there are cases, like I say, if the mother doesn't go back, because there's, there's a series of appointments that the child has to keep up with and they have to get a booster and things like that. And if the mother doesn't keep up with those appointments, it ups the um, possibility that the child will be in, in, in infected with hepatitis B. But that's an example of a transplacental or vertical transmission um, where a pathogen actually passes from mother to child. <clears throat> so um, now we're going to talk about indirect. Does anybody have any questions about direct? I'm trying to get this screen to come back up if I can. Um, I might have to even do this presentation over. All right, any questions about direct transmission? There's no questions, now we're gonna talk about indirect transmission. So indirect, um, uh, there's a vehicle transmission. Uh, this is where um, pathogens are transmitted through some type of vehicle such as water, food, or the air. So you have uh, waterborne, you have airborne, including dust particles, and then you have what is called foodborne.
So some examples of uh, waterborne would be things like cholera, uh, shigella, um, leptospirosis, campylobacter, things like that. Um, these are actually organisms that will live in water. Um, they're usually enteric, which means they come from something's digestive tract, whether it be human or other animal. Um, and they live in water and they wait for a host to come by and, you know, and either consume that water. Um, and then this is how the person is, becomes infected. Now, if you have things that are airborne, if you have things that are airborne, that would be things like uh, tuberculosis, hantavirus, uh, influenza, things like that. Now, remember we talked about the air droplets versus the aerosols, and we'll talk about more airborne when we get to that one at first. So the disease was or can be transmitted through breast milk. So Kyra has a question, I believe, are you talking about, um, Kyra wants to know, the disease was or can it be transmitted through breast milk? Are you talking about COVID-1, I mean COVID-19, or are you talking about other diseases? Because there are some diseases that can be transmitted, transmitted through breast milk. As far as COVID-19, I haven't seen any papers or any studies that have shown that it's uh, transmitted through breast milk, but I'm pretty sure some scientists is out there trying to determine if virus is indeed in breast milk, and if it is, what is the viral load in there? Um, is it able to cause trans, um, I'm sorry, cause infection? Uh, I bet they're also looking too to see if the mother, if the mother was uh, infected with uh, COVID-19 prior to giving birth. I bet they're trying to see too if there's antibodies in that milk, um, as well as if the child picked up any type of antibodies that would, um, you know, that would actually fight against the COVID-19 if the child was introduced to it. Um, there's no evidence either to suggest that COVID-19 is uh, transmitted through the uterus, um, I'm sorry, through the placenta, um, but like I say, it's all new, so this is a new virus that so they're really not sure, and they have no real data from when we had the other uh, coronavirus uh, SARS-like outbreak when we had the MERS CoV and when we had the SARS, there's no data showing if those um, if this virus can be transmitted that way. <clears throat> uh, so you're saying you asked another question. They said should should they should not be delivering food during the time from these restaurants. Technically, no, they shouldn't because if someone is there and they're coughing and sneezing, it can uh, that those you know that mucus and stuff can land on people's food, and they can become sick. Um, so, knowing that you should be deciding, should I be ordering food from these restaurants, or should I just be cooking at home? Um, because if I'm if, you know I'm I'm running a risk of infecting myself if these individuals that are working are not being honest and they're not saying you know. I do have it or I live in a household that with someone that does have it. Like I told you, there can be carriers that are asymptomatic, which means they actually have the virus, but they're not showing any symptoms. Um, there was a study that showed that the coronavirus could be shed through feces. So if they're going to the bathroom and they're not washing their hands properly, even though they may not be exhibiting the respiratory, they can still be shedding virus in their feces and they can make other people sick. Um, so yes, Delivering food and actually preparing food, although the virus can be killed with, you know, just a little bit of heat, just say they coughed on it after they packaged it up and you handle that package when you get home, when you open it up, you run the risk of infecting yourself if those viruses are on that surface. We're going to get through this today. We're going to get through. <laughs> okay. So there's another type of indirect. There's vector-borne, and there's trans transmission, and then there's mechanical transmission, and there's which is there's two different types of vector-borne transmissions. There's mechanical, and then there's biological. As soon as I can get the screen to come back up, we'll, we'll try to get to see that. 
gonna be a long presentation. <laughs> All right, so indirect. Um, vector borne transmission is by a mechanical or biological vector. An animal, typically an arthropod, so an arthropod would be anything like a tick or a mosquito that carries the disease from one host to another. So there's the first type we're going to talk about is a mechanical transmission. This is facilitated by a mechanical vector, an animal that carries a pathogen from one host to another without being infected itself. So the first picture on the left, you have a guy eating at a picnic probably, and there's a fly. I don't know if you guys can see. I don't know how big it is on the screen, but there's a fly that had just left either, you know, off some garbage or it might have been on a dead body or it could have been on some animal feces. It came and landed on his food. Um, and what happened is he, the, the fly picked up some, you know, maybe it picked up E. coli, maybe it picked up Shigella, whatever was in that item that it was crawling on prior to landing on that guy's food. And then what happens is that it leaves those pathogens on that meal. So the guy comes in, he doesn't either, either he notices the fly, he just shoots it away. He's not thinking like, oh, this fly could have been crawling on here and left some pathogens. So what happens is he eats the food and then he inadvertently infects himself because that fly had left, you know, say some salmonella E. coli on his meal. Uh, so then that way, after he consumes that meal, he has actually ingested those bacteria um, and, and he can become sick. They can also transmit things like, you know, viruses as well and some other uh, pathogens. Um, so just be mindful when you're out eating and, you know, flies land on your food. They are what are called mechanical um, vectors, which means they can actually transmit uh, bacteria on their feet. Um, they also regurgitate when they land on things. What they do is they regurgitate and then they eat that food back up. Or if they regurgitate, there may be bacteria in there that they're actually putting on your food that you can it can make you sick. So then we're going to talk about biological transmission. This occurs when the pathogen reproduces within a biological vector that transmits that pathogen from one host to another. So um, an example of a biological vector is an actual mosquito. So what happens is a mosquito, they'll feed on a person or an animal that has a virus. As they're feeding on it, if they are able to vector that particular virus, um, the um, mosquito will feed, the virus will get sucked up and it'll go down to the, into the mosquito's gut. Um, and if it's able to live in that mosquito's gut, and it's all this biological process that has to go through, because mosquitoes actually have their own immune systems and things that actually kill viruses, and we'll talk about that at the end. Um, but what happens is, is that if this is a pathogen that is able to, you know, replicate or, you know, live inside that mosquito's gut, when the mosquito goes and feeds on the next meal, she will re- um, she will infect that new person by uh, her saliva. When she goes in and she starts feeding, that pathogen will come out in her saliva and it'll actually be injected into that new person um, because their, their mouth parts are kind of like needles. They're hypodermic needles, kind of. And so what will happen is she'll be feeding and she'll be spitting. And then there are some microorganisms, especially when it comes to um, malaria, that trypanosome actually causes the mosquito to kind of choke and she actually has to cough up that trypanosome out of her throat and then that coughing type action I wouldn't say it's actual cough but she has to spit it up and what happens is she actually injects that trypanosome into a person um, and then that person ends up with malaria um, but like I said uh, there's two different types of uh, vectors that are indirect you know, you can have where an insect, you know, may have crawled on something that nasty, disgusting, and they crawl on your food and then you eat, eat it, or they can directly inject a, you know, pathogen into you by their feeding. So Kyra said, this is why I hesitate to eat at buffets that do not have covered lids over their food. Yeah, I mean, even beyond the flies, you have to think about people that walk up there and they're coughing, sneezing, touching all over the, you know, the, the utensils, 
They got kids picking up stuff, putting stuff back. You got adults doing that same thing. Um, yeah, it can get kind of nasty. I mean, I'm glad we got immune systems, but there's a lot of things that we could do to prevent disease had we had, you know, some type of biosecurity to prevent things from getting into there. So any questions about indirect so far or any questions about direct? A appreciable asset. So we have a question while I try to get the screen back up again. Um, DGM513 wants to know whatever happened to West Nile virus. West Nile virus is still is still very prevalent. Um, it's actually endemic now. So when I talked about last time, when I talked about, you know, the difference between pandemic, epidemic, and endemic, um, it's still there, but now they expect it to be there so they don't get concerned about it. Um, they're under the notion that, you know, it's in a population now, it's in the United States, um, and that, you know, it's there. We don't have to be concerned because for the most part, most people that were going to get it, um, they, they, they're not, I mean, there's not a lot, a lot of people that are going to get it now. Um, they still do testing for it. Um, but what happens is now is that it's not like it was when it was, you know, first emerging here in the United States. And I just closed the PowerPoint. Hold on, guys. So DGM also other question he wants to know. Um, It up there. So any mosquito season, should we still worry? Yes, the uh, the Vector 4 West Nile lives here in Ohio. It lives throughout the United States. It's called Culex pipiens. Um, that's called, that's the West Nile mosquito. Um, birds can still transmit the uh, virus, and that's usually where the mosquitoes pick it up from, are birds. Um, a lot of times you'll see, you know, dead birds, uh, out <clears throat> and that's how people are actually that's how the mosquitoes actually pick up the virus it's able to replicate in that mosquito's gut and i hope you guys know that mos the female mosquitoes are the only ones that actually bite and i'm going to do a actual presentation about mosquitoes on one of these sundays because we're getting into mosquito season um but know that mosquitoes are the only ones that bite but they bite depending on the mosquito they bite many hosts so if they're feeding on birds, they may be feeding on rodents. Some mosquitoes feed on reptiles and things like that. And that's how these, you know, passages are picked up. And then they go find you and feed on you. And that's how you become infected with it. Um, so, you know, I had a discussion one day with someone about, you know, disease transmission. And they were just under the assumption that if you were just consuming meat, that's the only way you get these diseases. And I said, no, there's multiple ways of getting a uh, disease. And it's not just always consumption of something. Um, you can breathe in things. You have these, you know, insect vectors. Ticks are another one. They can actually transmit lots of diseases. Um, and what happens is, you know, people are under the assumption that if you just wash your hands, you're going to be disease free. And I have to always explain there's other ways for you to get sick other than, uh, you know, a you know, just eating something or, you know, not washing your hands. There, there's many, many ways to get sick. But give me a second. I'm trying to reopen. I closed the wrong window. And so I had to reopen the uh, PowerPoint here. A great question. Um, another mosquito that's a concern here in the United States is the um, 
two. Uh, Aedes aegypti, which is the yellow fever mosquito, and Aedes albopictus, which is the um, Asian tiger mosquito. Um, we have we have Asian tiger mosquitoes here in Ohio, but down south they actually have Aedes albopictus and they have Aedes uh, aegypti, and they vector lots of diseases. Um, <clears throat> They vector lots of diseases, so um, you just have to be mindful of that. And that's why I say I'm going to do a whole presentation just on mosquitoes and explaining how, you know, they vector diseases as well as how you can prevent them and things like that. A lot of these mosquitoes bite during the day, and people don't know that. And so they're getting ate up during the day, not realizing that, uh, you know, mosquitoes can bite. There's certain species that bite during the day and there's certain species that bite during the night. <clears throat> and then also, you know, there's things like ticks that bite even in the wintertime. If you're outside and you get, uh, they select you as their food source. Um, hold on, I'm almost there. I'm having all types of technical difficulties today. Hopefully it can work if I had to close the window. Okay, so another indirect um, motor trans uh, disease transmission is airborne transmission. So dust and fine particles known as aerosols, which can float in the air, can carry pathogens. So airborne consider, is considered um, particles that travel over a meter. This is roughly three feet or more. Um, so an example of this would be hantavirus. I don't know if you guys have ever heard of that. Um, hantavirus is, um, it is a, virus that is actually transmitted in rat and uh, mice species. So the rat would be the reservoir or the mouse, mouse would be the reservoir. They use the bathroom, you know, and what happens is their feces become dust in the air and those viruses actually live on the surface of that dust and it gets aerosolized. So when you go into an environment where they are, where these feces are that have these, this virus on it and you kick up that dust, what happens is that dust goes down into your lungs and it causes, you know, respiratory failure and all types of bad things. And a person can actually die from hantavirus. Um, it looks very similar to the uh, SARS um, symptoms. You have coughing, you'll have fevers, you'll have chills. Then you can have respiratory failure. You know, people that are, you know, have respiratory issues, it can exasperate those as well. Um, so it's not, it's not something that you want to experience, but that's a form of airborne transmission. Um, I recently read a study about MERS, not MERS, COVID, but actually COVID-19 that showed that uh, that virus, which is the SARS-CoV-2, it, uh, it can actually live on particles in the air. So technically, it does have some airborne transmission. There's been a debate back and forth if it was aerosolized or if it's on droplets, and they're finding that it actually could be both. Um, they haven't outright said now. They, took, they redacted their statement when they said it was airborne, but then there's some scientists that have done studies in China as well as the United States that show that it can live on particles in the air for at least two hours. So technically it could be airborne. Um, so, I mean, you just decide there. If you decide that, you know, if it's airborne to you or not, sounds like it's airborne to me, but what do we know? And the way people are getting, supposedly getting sick, um, that would suggest that it could possibly be airborne. Let's see. Kyra said, rubbing neem oil on the skin can help prevent mosquitoes from biting you. Also use citronella oil as well. Yes, what happens when you rub oil on your skin, what it does is blocks the lactic acid on your skin so the mosquitoes cannot smell where your skin is so they do not know where to bite. Um, but mosquitoes, when I talk about them, there's a whole process that they go through before they actually bite you. They have to detect you there. They have to detect things like CO2, body heat, all that. 
and then they actually have to find a spot to bite you. Um, but neem oil, as well as a other some or more essential oils, they actually help block that lactic acid smell on your skin, so they cannot detect that you're there. <clears throat> all right, DM, DGM said, "Hello, chat. I hope all is well." Urban Farms says, "There's a springtime coming up. Should we be extra cautious with Corona and them spreading that?" Sorry, I was late to the live. Um, I I don't know about springtime. Um, I don't I don't know. We don't really know a lot about as far as what what will affect this virus and what will not. I haven't talked about the mosquitoes yet. We'll talk about that at the end. So if that's what you're asking about the mosquitoes, we'll talk about that at the end as they're being able to uh, infect with coronavirus. Um, Frank Williams said, "Hey, Urban Farm Sister, thanks for identifying the mole cricket. Oh, you're welcome." Um, all right, DJ on said, take your time. You have truly have a captivated audience with Michael Center clothes. <laughs> right. <clears throat> so Frank Williams said he wants to start a garden for the first time this year. Do you recommend having soil tested? If yes, by who? soil tested for, you know, nutrients and things. I'm going to do an actual presentation about um, starting a garden into uh, starting gardens, especially during this time frame. Um, that might be next Sunday. So I'll, I'll, I'll wait to answer that unless it's about being tested for like a pathogen or something. Um, and then Kyra said, thank you sharing this great information she said i'm doing great i'm trying you know this computer computer stuff this technology since everybody's at home now everybody's using the internet so it's like you know locking up everything <clears throat> okay so talk about airborne transmission please and they did it again um Next, we're going to talk about another indirect transmission called fomites transmission. And this one is where a lot of our diseases come from, fomites. So fomite transmission is when inanimate objects called fomites become infected contaminated by pathogens from an indirect, I'm sorry, from an infected inv individual or a reservoir. An example would be a blanket with chicken pox virus on it, a towel with MRSA on it, doorknobs with E. coli, or needles with hepatitis C on them. Um, so this is a lot of times how people get sick and, you know, they can wash their hands a million times, um, but, you know, if they pick up a blanket and say somebody else had been sick and that virus, whatever they had was on it, they don't realize it. And, you know, they touch it. They don't wash their hands after touching it because they're not thinking that this could actually carry, carry a pathogen on it. And they touch their face. You know, they rub their eyes, put their hands in their mouth. They can infect themselves that way. Or say they touch that blanket and then they go pick up, you know, a meal or, you know, they go and start eating. And they're touching it, say there's a sandwich, and they're touching that sandwich, you know, they can be infected that way. I mean, already talked about the needle transmission. That can be a direct, but it all can be also be indirect. Um, needles can get contaminated even if you're not doing, you know, you know, intravenous drug use and things, they can get contaminated other ways. Like if you go to a doctor's office and they're reusing needles or you know, things like that. Um, that's how you can have indirect transmission or the the needle could not have been sterilized and, you know, it looked like it was clean and someone used it. It's a, lot of, a lot of times that happens when people go and get tattoos and things. Um, they may sterilize it. It just may not have killed everything because maybe their machinery wasn't operating properly. So you can indirectly infect someone that way. Um, but fomites, this is a lot of times where most people get, um, you know, infected. If it's not a, you know, a direct contact or it's not an aerosolized or, you know, droplet, nine times out of 10 is something that that person touched. <clears throat> okay, Kyra said, I have seen videos where people are licking items at the grocery store. Just disgusting. And yes, that 
that would be yeah, that would actually be an indirect, if you actually purchased one of those items that someone had went in there and licked it, that would be an indirect uh, transmission to you um, because you didn't know that that had even been done. And if someone was still able to sell those items, yeah, you would be indirectly infected by somebody being, you know, just disgusting at the store. Okay, so another form of indirect is unclean hands transmission. So several infectious diseases can be spread from one person to another by contaminated hands. These diseases include gastrointestinal infections such as salmonella and respiratory infections such as influenza. So gastrointestinals are those that live in your uh, digestive tract. Um, those are things like salmonella, E. coli, shigella, um, even, um, what is the other one, listeria can actually live in the uh, digestive tract. Um, and what happens is if you, you know, go to the bathroom, you don't properly wash your hands after a bowel movement, or if you take your change in a diaper, or you're picking up animal feces or something, it, it, I mean, there's lots of ways that you can come into contact with, um, you know, some gastrointestinal bacteria and viruses. There's norovirus that causes, you know, vomiting, diarrhea, and it usually lasts for about 24 to 48 hours. Um, but there's a lot of ways that your hands become dirty. And it's very important that you actually go wash them. Don't just use the hand sanitizer. We already talked about, I already talked about how those are not really even effective anyway. Um, but a lot of people, they solely rely on hand sanitizer to kill pathogens. And that's not, that's not the case. There's contact time that, you know, hasn't been established that will actually, you know, go about killing the pathogen as well as um, you have to have the right concentration of alcohol. It's some, some alcohols are more, you know, effective at a higher concentration or a lower concentration. You have to know that, but, you know, a hand sanitizer is not going to cover that whole spectrum. Um, some respiratory infections are things like influenza and as well as, you know, the SARS-CoV-2, um, rhinovirus, all types of, uh, you know, respiratory viruses, uh, as well as some, there are some bacterial infections like whooping cough, also known as uh, pertussis. Oh, that was going to work for me. So now we're going to talk about um, another mode of disease transmission that people often overlook because because you would think that because you're in a um, medical facility that you wouldn't pick up a pathogen. But in reality, you're at ground zero when it comes to being in a hospital. Uh, so we're going to talk about nosocomial infections. And I had, you know, posted this word on my Facebook as well as on Instagram, because I was, uh, I was under the impression that people knew what this was. But um, nosocomial infections are infections that develop uh, as a result of a stay in a hospital or a medical facility or are produced by microorganisms and viruses acquired during a hospitalization. So a stay at a hospital would be like maybe you went into a doctor's appointment and you were like there for a few hours or half an hour or whatever, and you, you know, somehow pick up a, a pathogen. You don't necessarily have to be hospitalized to um, get these infections. Um, these are a very big problem. Um, people come in, you know, they might come, have came in for something simple and end up leaving out and having to be treated for MRSA, other staph infections. Um, you know, people have come in and ended up with Legionnaire's disease, which is um, it's a it's a type of pneumonia that's caused by a, uh, <clears throat> it's a, a bacteria, Legionella uh, bacteria, and it gets into the lungs and it causes pneumonia. And, you know, it has killed a lot of people, uh, usually older people uh, usually succumb to it, but that's not always the case. Um, it causes pneumonia, causes people have had to be put on ventilators and all types of things, even young people. Um, it's usually associated with uh, faulty air conditioning units or um, uh, people that have like hot tubs and things, they live in that, they like that, that moist, humid type 
warm air. Uh, even though I, you know, an air conditioner has gives out cool air, it has that part of it that, that creates that condensation and things, and that's where these uh, Legionella bacteria like to live. Um, a lot of times when people get on cruises and things like that, they end up picking up Legionnaires' disease as well. Um, but Legionnaires' disease, uh, vancomycin resistant, uh, enterococcus, uh, enterococcus is another bacteria that people often get at the hospital. And then I know for now, for sure for now, that people are picking up the um, SARS-CoV-2 virus that causes the uh, COVID-19. There's no way, I mean, I, I I've had people telling me directly, like, they're having to reuse their masks because they don't have any, having to reuse their, their PPE, which we'll talk about what that is in a second. Um, they're having to use it, and they're just going from patient to patient. And not all patients coming in there actually have coronavirus. But if you have that virus on you and you go see the next person and you didn't change your, your, your PPE, what happens is you run the risk of infecting that person. And so this is really happening in the uh, hospital with this uh, particular virus, as well as other things. I mean, you got to think we're in flu season, we're in cold season. Um, there's fun, fungi going, coming in and out of there. And at this rate, since most of the hospitals are being, you know, ran to capacity, they're not able to clean and disinfect like they should be able to. So you are running the risk of infecting a lot of people now. Um, under the circumstances that we're under right now. So any questions about indirect nosocomial infections or direct infections? As I reload the screen again. All right, so personal protective equipment. Um, these are some things that you can do to minimize your exposure. Uh, personal protective equipment, also known as PPE for short, um, is equipment worn to minimize exposure to hazards that cause serious workplace injuries and illnesses. Uh, personal protective equipment may include items such as gloves, safety glasses and shoes, earplugs or muffs, hard hats, respirators, coveralls, vests, and full body suits. Disposable PPE should not be used over and over again. Um, and that we just talked about nosocomial infections, but this is how people that probably didn't have COVID-19 ended up with it when they went to the hospital. So if you're going to the hospital right now because they have a shortage on, you know, all types of materials, the mask, um, the, um, the goggles, the face shield, all of that, they have a shortage on all of this stuff. Uh, if you don't have to go to the hospital, I would not go to any any hospital. Now, if you're having symptoms and things like that, I would definitely, you know, suggest that you go. But if you're just going because, you know, you, you may be going to visit someone or, you know, you may have had some electric surgery that you were going to, you still want to happen. A lot of the doctors now, the surgeons and things, they're canceling a lot of, you know, surgeries that were elected by that person because they just don't have the, the bed space um, and they just don't have the uh, time as well as, you know, going into the hospital, you're going into ground zero. So that means you're setting yourself up to be infected with uh, COVID-19 as well as a whole bunch of other pathogens uh, at this at this rate. Like again, I said, we're in flu season. So you have to think about the flu. You have to think about pertussis. You have to think about COVID-19 as well as uh, people are coming in with enteric diseases and things like that. So um, you just have to be mindful of that. <clears throat> so anybody have questions about PPE? 
I think they're going to have some masks that are coming in from um, the CDC had a stockpile about 9 million or something. Um, but I mean, if they're claiming that we're, you know, the highest case of cases of this, they're going to go right through that very quickly because they're not supposed to wear those same items over and over again. They're supposed to change them out. Yeah, uh, <laughs> DGM said right now I do my own stitches. Yeah, if if you can take your own stitches out, I would I would suggest you take your own stitches out because you would hate to go in there for some stitches and end up with COVID nineteen. All right, so now we're gonna talk about some things you can do to minimize your exposure as far as it pertains to isolation and um, quarantine. So I, I, I keep hearing these terms, um, you know, talked about over and over again, and people are kind of confused about what they are, and they're not understanding why they have to be uh, isolated at home and things like that. So I thought I would explain what each one of these are. So isolation, uh, it separates sick people with a contagious disease from people who are not sick. So, you know, um, <clears throat> when you're when they're telling you to isolate at home, they're telling you to stay at home. Number one, if you're not sick, we don't want you out with people that may be sick because what will happen is you all will end up sick. Now, if you're sick. You need to stay home so you're not infecting other people and you need to isolate and you need to stay isolated for at least 21 days to make sure that you do not become symptomatic. Um, with this COVID-19, it has a long incubation period. I think it's 14 days, um, but they're saying that it could even be up to 30 something days. So, you know, I recommend people stay at least 21 days if you develop symptoms within 21 days. Um, you know, isolating yourself, that, that would be more ideal. Um, also, when it comes to quarantine, so when a person is quarantined, that means they separate and restrict their movements of people who were exposed to a contagious disease to see if they become sick. So when you hear that word quarantine in the, in the news, that meant that somebody was in close contact with someone that actually was a positive case. And it doesn't necessarily have to even be for uh, COVID-19. It can even be for the flu. If someone, if you were in a, say you went to a party or something and someone was sneezing and coughing there and then they went home and they went to the doctor the next day and they were testing and they found that they had influenza A and they came back and told you, oh yeah, I came back positive for the flu. You would want to quarantine yourself um, for at least seven to 14 days because you were exposed to someone that was probably at that point in time contagious when they were in your presence. Um, quarantining, that doesn't necessarily mean that you're sick. It just means that you're, you're isolate, you're keeping yourself out of, um, out of the public while you wait and see if you become sick. Um, and hopefully you don't become sick, but you have to stay in, quarantine during that incubation period and if you do become sick then you definitely have to isolate so that you do not, do not make people that are not sick sick um the social distancing thing that means remain out of um congregated settings avoid mass gatherings and maintaining a distance approximately six feet or two meters from others when possible when you are out in a public setting so social distancing is you when you go outside, do not congregate, do not get in you no know, large groups. Even when they say that 10, 10 people are less, those 10 people, nine of them can have the flu. I mean, I'm sorry, have the COVID-19 or have some disease and you can actually pick that up. Um, so uh, social distancing is just keeping your distance between people. If you have to go out into a social or, you know, a public setting. Um, this, even if you're in a hospital setting and you try, you want to try to distance yourself. Also, when you're in a hospital setting, you want to make sure you're not touching on everything. Um, if you have to go to the hospital, you don't want to make sure, you, make sure you're not touching on everything. Make sure you're keeping your distance from people that are sneezing and coughing. 
um, things like that will prevent your exposure to COVID-19 as well as other pathogens. So some other things that you can minimize your exposure, we're gonna talk about these masks for a second um, because I know people, people have, uh, I don't know, they've been, they've been making their own masks out of weird things. Um, they've been selling masks. Um, some people have found, you know, the respirator mask online. And I don't even know how, how, you know, how good they are, especially the sources they may be getting them from. They may not even be what people think they are. Um, but the mask, why surgical masks may be effective in blocking flashes and large particle droplets. A face mask by design does not filter or block very small particles in the air that may be transmitted by coughing, sneezes, or certain medical procedures. Surgical masks also, also do not provide protection from germs and other contaminants because of the loose fit between the surface of the face mask and your face. The N95 designation means that when subjects <clears throat> subjected to careful testing, the respirator blocks at least 95% of very small micron particles, uh, test particles. Uh, if properly fitted, the filtration capabilities of N95 respirator exceed those of face masks. However, even a properly fitted N95 respirator mask does not completely eliminate the risk of illness or death. Um, so the COVID-19 virus itself, the size it's about 0.2 microns, between 0.2 and 0.3 microns. So if you're having a surgical mask on, I think the microns on those, it was like 0.9 or 0.8. So um, definitely a virus could go right through that mask. There's no filter or anything to keep it from going through there. Even with the N95 mask, I mean, things can get through, but for the most part, it does a pretty good job of blocking viruses as well as dust particles and things like that. Um, so that's why they're very important for the hospital setting. Um, they will also be very important if you are living in a household that with someone that was actually uh, infected with COVID-19 or any other type of upper respiratory infection and you wanted to make sure you were not exposed and you were you were responsible for their treatment, you would want to have one of these masks as well to make sure that you're not breathing in uh, those uh, viruses and things. Yes, they make them very tight by design. Uh, they're supposed to fit your face. And they're supposed to create not, they're supposed to fit your face so there's no gaps in created in between there so viruses and things can't get around. Uh, where it touches your face. So yes, they're supposed to fit tight. The only thing with the N95, um, sometimes they're hard to breathe. Uh, you know, after you've had it on for so long, it kind of gets hard to breathe. But just note that that's going to be the better mask. Um, not these things that you're finding on the internet where they're telling you to make paper towel mask and, you know, take a bra and make a mask out of a bra or, you know, people are just making masks out of regular fabric. And they're not looking at the, the you know, the, the fiber, the, um, the microns of the fiber. If it's not small enough, the, that, uh, the virus as well as some other microorganisms can just go right through there and you're still just breathing it in. Um, I don't know. I saw a report earlier today that said, uh, oh, it's fine to use the mask. Uh, just, to, you know, the regular old mask that people are making are the, are the surgical masks. Um, but they they made that statement based off because the nurses are using the mask in the hospital, so we should be okay using them here. The reason the nurses are using the mask in the hospitals is because there's a shortage of the N95 that they need. So they're, they're trying to use whatever they have available, but in reality, they may not even be protecting themselves. I've seen a lot of stories, I don't know how valid or true they are, that they were saying that a lot of medical providers are becoming sick with the virus. I don't know. These are, you know, he say, she say stories. These are Facebook posts. These are news media. So you, you have to decide, like, who's telling the truth, who's not telling the truth. So any questions um, about N95 masks or 
right now. All right, we got two more slides, so we have to do this two more times. Hopefully it's not like this when I do my other presentations this week. All right, so I want to talk about co-infection. Um, a co-infection is when a person has two or more infections at the same time. So I did some research to find some cases of people that were infected with um, not just COVID-19, but also other viruses. Um, and they do exist. So I found this one study, um, several Stanford medi uh, medicine data scientists are working on various aspects of COVID-19. They perform 562 SARS-CoV-2 SARS-CoV-2 is the actual name of the virus that causes, causes COVID-19. COVID-19 stands for Coronavirus Disease of 2019. That's what that stands for. Um, but they were testing uh, people that came into the emergency department uh, up until March 17, 2020. Uh, of the 562 patients, 181 of them were tested for flu, A, B, and uh, rhinovirus, and 336 of them were tested with a uh, virus panel. So it would cover not just um, flu, it would cover a, a gamut of uh, different viruses and things. Of that 562 patients, 127 were positive for other viruses, <clears throat> and of the 49 49 of them were actually positive for the, the um, SARS-CoV-2. 11 of them actually had co-infections. Um, of the 122 positive for the other viruses, 11 of those had that SARS-CoV-2 uh, co-infection. So that meant that these people were picking up, they weren't just sick with uh, COVID-19, they were also sick with flu as well as other uh, viral infections. And they didn't even test for bacterial because it could have been some people were infected with, you know, um, pertussis, uh, strep pneumo and things like that, and strep throat, um, all types of things. So um, I just wanted to put this up there. You know, you keep seeing all these stories about people either died from because they had COVID-19 or, you know, they're infected with COVID-19, but nobody's talking about people that are infected with multiple things. Until they do an actual, actual autopsy, they can't really say that the actual SARS-CoV-2 virus is the culprit that killed the individual. It could be that they had the flu at the same time and the flu caused the death, but they're not talking about co-infections. They're only talking about, oh, this person had COVID-19. They came back positive for COVID-19. And I, you know, they're not even, they're not even saying that they're even testing, even with these 562 people. Um, when you add those numbers up with that, what they did test, it still didn't come up to 562. So there was a about uh, a little bit, maybe a little bit less than uh, maybe about 100 people that were not tested for multiple things. They were only tested for the uh, COVID-19. Um, so, you know, they may, have been, they may have came in there with symptoms, but they were only tested for COVID-19, but they weren't tested for anything else. And then they could have, you know, they could have had the flu and been hospitalized and actually died from the flu. We, we will never know because no one's, you know, talking about the other things that are going on out there. So I just want to talk about co-infections and uh, that they do exist and that people can be sick with multiple infections at once. And so when they're saying like, oh, the person didn't present the, the, the correct symptoms when they're saying like, oh, they didn't have a, the dry cough, they had, you know, watery eyes and things. Well, yeah, they still could have had both. They could have had COVID-19 and they could have had allergies. They could have had COVID-19. They could have had a cold. Um, they need really need to look into co-infections here uh, because people could be having, you know, multiple things going on and that could be the reason why they're, you know, dying or, you know, a, a lot of things they're having other complications because they have multiple things going on. And Kyra said many other companies are out of the mask. I don't, I don't know if they're out of the mask. There, there, there's a lot of 
uh, money trying to be made here as well. So it could be people are just withholding things to to see who can they who could who could they can get a higher price from. Um, so you have to remember that. All right. So the last thing I want to talk about was can the mosquitoes transmit COVID nineteen virus? And my computer just cooperate. And the answer is no. Mosquitoes cannot uh, transmit this particular virus because they are not biological vectors or host for coronaviruses. Um, these viruses are only found in mammals. And uh, the mosquito, it is not a mammal. And also the virus cannot reproduce inside the mosquito or replicate itself inside the mosquito's uh, body. Uh, mosquitoes also have their own immune systems that they use to fight viruses. You know, since they are consuming blood, they're always going to encounter some type of pathogens because there's all types of pathogens that live in blood, um, depending on, and also depends on what um, reservoir they're actually feeding off of. Um, if the virus survives the initial defenses in the mosquito's gut, the virus must surpass several additional barriers to infection before transmission via saliva can occur. The virus must infect and escape the mosquito's gut cells in order to replace, uh, I'm sorry, in order to replicate in the mosquito's body cavity. Virus particles must also infect and escape salivary gland cells to be transmitted to another host during the next blood feeding. Um, so there's a whole lot of steps that have to be taken. And I put this picture up here. It shows the mosquito's immunity um, to viruses. The viruses that they are able to um, um, transmit, it has taken, you know, years and years of those, those pathogens being able to evolve and things like that. Um, now, I'm not going to say that Somebody in the lab ain't trying to make this a possibility because things can be done in labs. But naturally occurring, mosquitoes cannot at this time transmit coronaviruses. Um, but like I say, there's always that up in the air, somebody playing around with science. You know, they, they, they do things in those labs. Um, but at this point, mosquitoes are not a, a, a vector. They are a vector of many other diseases, um, but uh, this uh, SARS-CoV-2 is not one of them. <clears throat> All right, so anybody have any questions? No questions? Did you learn something this evening? All right, so in conclusion, infectious diseases can be transmitted in many ways. Uh, proper um, PPE, isolation, and quarantine can stop the spread of disease. Um, so if you guys have any questions, let me know. See if I can go to the next thing. Just going to talk about the school website. Um, so I will put the information that I used to make this presentation on the school website. And you can go to, to the tab that says uh, Sunday live discussions um and i'll put you know links to the articles and things that i use uh, to make this presentation as well as the other presentations i've done um so if you guys have any questions you can ask them if you don't want to ask them here you can always send me an email or you can reach out to me on social media um under urban farm system you can send those questions to direct message or you know inbox But if that, there's no questions, that's the end of today's uh, long broadcast because I had technical difficulties, but I got through it. Um, I thank you guys for watching. And yes, I'll be back next Sunday. I think I'm going to switch from talking about diseases unless something else comes up. Um, I know that they were uh, talking about using a malarial drug. Um, to treat the, um, the virus. 
So the malarial drug is not an antiviral. I already talked about what antivirals are, where you find uh, the things that are that are antiviral, why they are antivirals. A malarial drug, that's a parasite. Um, it will not work on a, um, probably won't work on a virus. It also is very poisonous and it can be deadly. Um, so that's one of those things that, you know, you have to think about. I also saw they were using azithromycin on um, some of the patients that they antibiotic. Again, that's for bacteria. This is a virus. Um, they were saying they were using it because they were trying to make sure people didn't have secondary viral, I mean, bacterial infections. Um, but with azithromycin, the FDA a few years ago said that uh, it can cause some heart damage. Um, and what they were finding that people that were reinfected, there's multiple, according to the news now, there's eight strains of uh, this COVID-19 type virus. Um, they claim it has mutated that quickly. That's just very abnormal. Something something weird is going on here. So there really are eight strains. Um, but they were finding people were reinfected with the strain um, that a lot of times, if they had heart issues, those are the ones that became fatal when they were reinfected. So if you're taking a dysromycin and it damages your heart and you get reinfected, you up your chances of, you know, succumbing to this virus or succumbing to a heart condition that's exasperated by this virus. Um, so just know that too. Um, I think I'll post something about the dysromycin in the folder as well as the uh, malarial drug. <clears throat> so you guys can know that, you know, that malaria drug is also used for people with um, some autoimmune diseases. And, you know, it, uh, it, it's, it's not an antiviral, so I don't know why it's being used. I think they're just grasping their straws and they don't know what to use. They're just trying to find something that they think may or may not work. So that's what they're doing. Um, but yeah. So again, thank you guys for, uh, watching tonight's live. I apologize for technical difficulties. I think it's due to people, everybody being at home using the internet. Um, and there's, you know, a lot of people are live streaming now, um, different things. So it's uh, causing traffic and issues. But I thank you guys for attending. If you have any questions, get at me. All right, I'll talk to you guys later. Bye.